this introduction. Good morning, everybody. And the uh, first session, the uh, first chair for this uh, session, I will introduce the first speaker, Professor Linda Ayer Becker. Uh, she is the Chief Operating Officer of the Desmond HIV Foundation. Professor Linda Horst, PhD, and she is the Deputy Director of the Desmond II HIV Center at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. She's also, uh, she is also a physician scientist, has a keen interest in HIV, tuberculosis, and related diseases. Her research and interests include programmatic and action research on HIV rollout and TB integration, prevention of HIV in women, youth, and men who have sex with men. She has contributed to a number of publications emanating from Desmond Tutu HIV Center on topics relevant to the South African HIV and TB indigenous. In their call, in the foundation, she is passionate about community development. She is also a major past president of the International Health Society. So help me welcome the professor in that day. by treatment, the triumph of treatment, the impact we've had on meds, the number of people on treatment next. And we have some very specific targets, the 1990 goal, um, that really keep us focused on where we need to, to be. Yeah. Here are the UNAIDS numbers at the moment. We're at about 79% uh, tested, 78% in treatment, and 86% of those virus makes next. next. This is promise um, of accessing treatment and getting treatment to as many people as possible means that we have this promise of treatment as prevention. So with enough people accessing treatment and virally suppress, we, uh, with the evidence from HPTN 052, partners 1 and 2, this remarkable concept of undertaking means untransmissible, that actually there's this promise of prevention if there was enough treatment. However, next. We know that um, through the impact of treatment, we are starting to see some uh, improvement in incidence rates. So what you see on, on the right in this region, some reduction in incidence, although there are regions on the continent and of course the eco-region that we're all very concerned about, where we do still feel an increase in incidence. Next. So globally, whilst again we're seeing that slope coming down, it really isn't coming down fast enough. And as you see in the blue line, 75% of infections happening in this region. 1.7 million last year. Next. And of course, our region is where most of the prevalence is occurring. And that uh, donut graph on the, on the right tells you where most of the infections are. So largely a generalized epidemic. Next. And of note, where most of the non-suppression is occurring, where viral load is still detectable, is in the same regions where we have a lot of prevalence. Next. So the reality is that we have not reached the goal that we were hoping for. In fact, 63% initiated around the world, but 50% of those virally 
uh, suppressed. And so what you see is that there are still susceptible people around the world at risk of HIV acquisition. And four important, five important uh, trials have recently uh, just been completed, particularly in this region, looking at the impact of universal testing treatment have shown that whilst we may see some reduction in incidence, um, up to 30% in, in at least a, a couple of the, the UTT trials, we haven't uh, got quite to the global epidemic control that we need. And so we really need to do more. Next slide. And so 1.7 million infections in 2018 amounted to almost 5,000 infections in the There is no doubt primary prevention has to be on the agenda. Next slide. And this is the prevention gap. Um, and it is because of this that we today um, are happy that biomedical prevention has suddenly exploded in the last two years. And I'll be telling you about that in the next few minutes. Next slide. <coughs> next. So whilst we have a fantastic suite of uh, prevention options, and uh, one of them is mother to child, which I will not be covering today, but I sworn that until we eliminate mother to child, I'm going to say that absolutely every uh, talk I have an opportunity to, that we have to, work harder to eradicate mother to child. Today, 300 children will be born infected with their child and have to be born. But in today's talk, I'm going to concentrate on pre-exposure prophylaxis because it is universal, it's discreet, it is sex act independent, it's easy, it's safe, tolerable, and highly effective. Next. So if you like, the way to think about it is it is a chemical condom that potentially safeguards those three million odd people who are at risk that you and has told us we need to reach the crimes prevention as soon as possible. And it takes into consideration that if the, the positive uh, sex partner is not known in terms of their status or not undetectable, then that person is uh, protected from HIV infection. So an additional option within the prevention suite. Next. Next. So starting with PrEP past. Next slide. It all started, if you can remember, in Vienna 2010 with the Caprice the W4 trial. The knock of the gel, uh, the Caprice team announced that they had seen a 30% reduction in women who were using the Tanoff not a vaginal microbicide. Thereafter, we had the Global IPEC study, Partners Group, and TV2, all of which contributed to the licensing of uh, our Truvada to not for the interest to be correct. And following that, you see over a five to six year period, the licensing occurring throughout the world and the movement towards the rollout of our pre-exposure prophylaxis. Next slide. And it was in fact up to 12 randomized trials, some with the placebo arm, some with the no prep arm, that showed that overall there was a risk reduction, we can expect a risk reduction of 0.5 in people using prep beta 0.3, uh, in men who have sex with men again 0.3, happily in women who have vaginal sex 0.5. We're struggling a little bit with the young people, 27. Uh, but further to that, a couple more trials, and, uh, in particular amongst these crowd and either gay using an intermittent but quantity dependent We actually saw effectiveness rates up to a 90% reduction of uh, HIV, leading to the WHO making a strong recommendation that oral prep is recommended for all people at substantial risk of HIV around the world. Next slide. Unfortunately, two of those randomized uh, clinical trials conducted in this part of the world uh, amongst women who have sex with men uh, did not show effectiveness. Um, and this led to the notion that perhaps women didn't want prep 
all oh, that trick didn't work in, in, in African women. And there were various scientific um, uh, speculations, such as perhaps, of course, that this is a KNC region, uh, there was tissue penetration problems, viral load very high in partners, vaginal dysbiosis, um, abrogating the effect of prep and, and potentially STIs. Next slide. In terms of women not wanting prep, when we have offered prep to young women, especially in the southern region, and I believe this is the, the case throughout Africa, women in fact are very excited about uh, oral prep. They want to be in control of their sexuality and they feel that they can be part of the movement. Next slide. So what actually happened in these two clinical trials, one with their prep and the other voice? It seems that approximately half of the women never had any to offer their any of that levels um, at the time of the trial. So fewer than a quarter of the women had to not have that detected in all of these cells. And the remaining women had some evidence of using the product or fear to intermittently. So really, the problem here was not that the product doesn't work, but that in these populations of women, and various reasons have been raised, suspicion around the placebo, suspicion about the, the actual a very new innovation, not understanding the infection taken. Various reasons then is why women do not use our food standard product. Next slide. But a meta analysis followed looking at all this, the trials that involved cisgendered women. And in fact, when oral prep is used effectively um, in at least at least 32% of the time, there was a 50% efficacy. Uh, sorry, a 32% and there's 61 percent efficacy, 25 percent use. So again, coming back to this notion, typically a product needs to be used in order to have an effect. Next slide. And importantly, uh, amongst women in our region who are wanting to conceive, this becomes a very important biological tool. Using prep at the time of safe conception protects the uninfected mother. Um, and we know this is a time when young women are at high risk of each other position. So prep for women for safer conception is definitely um, something to consider. Next slide. So what has been our experience to date? Well, there have been about 131 demonstration for, uh, studies that have followed the licensing of oral tribada prep. Um, they, this, these have occurred in 68 countries involving 54 stakeholders. But unfortunately, this hasn't been altogether um, organized in a systematic way. And I think there's some lessons we can learn post oral prep uh, licensure that we can take forward. And I'll come back to that. But the recommendations would be that we, we organize the post trial approval period in a more systematic way. Next slide. And so it's taken about seven years for us to get from the point where we knew that PrEP was effective to the point that we are now having large uh, bridge to scale and bigger rollout such as uh, is occurring in the dreams at the PEP farm program. Next slide. So seven years on, uh, the PrEP has been licensed in a number of countries around the world, um, and there are about 400,000 people using oral prep today. Mostly, unfortunately, where prevalence is not that high. Next slide. So the prevention gap um, is we have 1.7 million infections because we're not quite where we need to be in terms of treatment as prevention. And clearly, having we moved our biomedical technology out to those people who need it most. Next slide. So, in summary, I think we've had a slow start in many settings. There's still some countries that need to get off the starting blocks. There has been offering hesitancy to women, particularly African women. Um, health policy systems and practitioners have all been barriers with beliefs, concerns about safety, concerns about resistance and sexual disinhibition all playing into that. And implementation sites have not been well coordinated 
and has been slow to provide the answers to policy makers. Next slide. So let's move to where we are today. Next slide. South Africa, Kenya, and the US are the countries that have had most of the initiations, about 25,000. I want to shout out to Zim as well, uh, that is closely behind um, Kenya and Uganda. Next slide. And Kenya has been very much the poster child with their road map to prevention. They were first to get off the starting blocks in Africa. And you can see uh, that they moved quickly. Uh, next slide. Um, and have initially target, targeted disability recovery, but increasingly have a focus on young women and girls. Next slide. In my own country, there has been a slow start, um, again with a phase in key pops focus. Um, next slide. But now we're beginning to catch up with young women and girls, which is where most of our incidents is uh, occurring. And next slide. And I'm pleased to announce that in 2020, we will be moving to more than 3,000 uh, primary health care clinics throughout the country for the goal of more than a, a half a million oral PrEP users next year alone. Next slide. In my own organization, we've done a number of uh, pilot studies, and I want to just highlight a few next things. First and foremost, amongst every single one of these pilots, with young women and girls and young men who have sex with men, we have seen extraordinary high asymptomatic STIs at baseline. So we certainly are pulling in a population of young people who are engaging in condom with sex. Next slide. We've learned that demand creation and familiarization is key. There is a high interest. The non-return rate early on is high and concerning. But I think this is about people figuring out whether they think oral pain is for them or not. Uh, those people who stick with it, who persist, and um, seem to stick with it into the long run. And here it starts well, but it does decrease over time. Um, and there seems to be excellent self-identification of people who need pain. Non-users express concern about effectiveness, stigma, side effects, and final dispersion of this fact. Our model, therefore, is to think about um, persistence and being something that people cycle on and cycle off with, um, and using PrEP when they perceive themselves to be at risk and stopping their use when they don't. And Jessica Haberer described this as effective use, and I think this is the paradigm that we need to get used to uh, and move forward. Next slide. So, as we think about the PrEP cascade, I think rather than the adherence, we should about effective use, about persistence, and then this notion that people will cycle in and out of it. Next slide. And the best way that I can imagine an oral pick is really the best analogy is that of contraception. So we started with first generation oral contraception, but we became very aware that when people were offered choice, and their stick, stickability, if you like, they used their their retention within uh, oral contraceptive use uh, increased. And I imagine that this is going to be the same with PrEP. And so we need to diversify our PrEP options. Um, and that's what I'll talk about in the next slide. So the first diversification, of course, is taking us back to topical, that of the vaginal uh, ring. Uh, two trials completed in this part of the world with the green vaginal ring showing a 0.5 risk reduction. Um, and now the vaginal risk is sitting with the European Medicine Agency um, for approval for Section 58 in a WHO recommendation for women in low and middle income countries as a second line to all of them. And we're hoping to hear about that very soon. Next slide. The next innovation has been to look at other ways of dosing. And one of the first um, uh, trials that showed the efficacy of PrEP, of course, was IPGAM, which employed this notion of quickly dependent oral PrEP, the 211 regimen, two pills within 24 hours, 48 hours of sex, one pill 24 hours later, and another pill 24 hours after that. Um, and it is now being, that showed a, a very high 
in this amongst the men who are seeking the men. There is now an open men in Spania on the way that we carry students in Rhoda and shoots to result early next year. Men are choosing half of them on choosing day equipment and half of them on choosing the 211. Next slide. The next innovation is to talk about a different kind of antiviral. And of course, the one uh, that has recently been in the spotlight has been the cousin of uh, TDF, FTDF, and that is ITAC. Um, it is a pro drug which has lower plasma levels, less toxicity, and is a smaller pill to take. It is also recommended um, for oral pain. And uh, the, the randomized trial, which has been completed next time. And the trial was called Discover. Uh, it, looked, it, it was a non inferiority compact comparing FTDF to FTAP. And you see that non inferiority was reached. Next slide. And as mentioned, because of lower plasma levels, quicker action, uh, we do see less toxicity with this particular intervention. Less renal, less bone toxicity. Next slide. So this uh, has been approved by the FDA. Uh, unfortunately, because the discovered trial did not include cisgender women, the uh, licensure is not for women. Next slide. Many people have been concerned about resistance in our approach. So I think one or uh, two slides to this. Just to note that most of the resistance we've seen in people taking oral prep have been amongst people starting oral prep whilst seroconverting. So it's very important that people are not completely infected when they initiate oral prep. So you see in this slide the bulk of the resistance that has occurred, and it hasn't been much, um, has been in those people who were in that window period uh, of seroconversion in oral prep. Next slide. And John Mellis has described this very nicely as the zone of resistance risk, and it depends how wide that window is. So, in other words, if somebody is not taking their drug, they may become infected, but they can't become resistant. If they are taking drug very well, they're going to be protected. They're not going to get infected, and again, why be resistance? But there's that zone in the middle, which occurs uh, particularly when somebody's just. Uh, coming in. Next slide. So scaling up print has already shown some benefits. So here are um, four cities, San Francisco, uh, Seattle, London, and Sydney, uh, where you can see that it has been a really very nice real-world doc uh, documented reduction in incidents. Obviously, in all these cities, there has also been rollout of treatment. Next slide. So this really does, you know, give us the evidence that when treatment and primary prevention come together, we do see uh, an aggregation of infection. Next slide. So the first generation of PrEP now is well established, where rollout has been slow in some regions, mostly due to policy costs, funding, and misinformation. However, rollout is steadily increasing. And we're starting to see the first diversification in PrEP options, frequency of dosing, type of antiretrovirals, and route of administration. Next slide. So I'm going to move now quickly through the future. Next slide. And obviously, we want to think about formulations and active ingredients as we think about what the future looks like. Next slide. I'm going to turn these, the super heroes. The injectables, the infusibles, the topicals, and the implantable. Next slide. So starting first with the injectable, cabotegravir is well on its way. This uh, cabotegravir long acting is a long acting suspension for delivery by intramuscular injections. It's a sister or brother, if you like, of donutegravir and interface inhibitor. Uh, next slide has a very long half of life. Next slide. And then here you see the phase two which showed that cabotegravir is safe and well tolerated, um, and the dose that has been chosen is an eight-week dose. Next slide. So there are two trials underway at the moment, um, both uh, in Africa and in the first world. 
in male sex between transgender women and um, cisgender women. Next slide. The one consideration you have to think about is that long half life means that there is a long tail. And when administering agents with a long half life, we may need an oral feeding to ensure that we don't have toxicity. And we may need a prolonged sun therapy. We may have a prolonged sun therapy tail, which may also require um, cover with oral treatment. Next slide. What about the infusible? Um, and yesterday, Larry introduced you to the organ neutralizing antibodies. I'll go to this next slide. The neutralizing antibodies um, have great promise. They've really come into their own in the last few years when we have identified new targets on the HIV virus. The first uh, that is being developed is BRCL1, which targets the CD4 binding site on GP120. Next slide. And BRCL1 has um, shown, next slide, uh, that it has um, neutralizing capability that is good and um, with a uh, a good um, a range of uh, viruses that it is able to take on. Um, and so again, next slide, we are uh, developing this in clinical trial. We have study fully enrolled and we will be getting these results uh, next year again, both in men of sexual and women in such a high level. Next slide. So we now have a wonderful batch of broadly neutralizing antibodies with a, a, a wide range of great potency. Next slide. And uh, very exciting. There has already been a combination of these sites into one single broadly neutralizing tricyclic antibody, which is described very nicely in science a couple of years ago. Next slide. And then you see the triple um, tricyclic antibody. Next slide. Um, and although each of those antibodies have some breakthrough infection when combined into this tri-specific, we really see no infection in animal um, studies uh, to date. Uh, so this is also moving into human clinical trials now. Next slide. So a very exciting pipeline of multi neutralizing antibodies coming down the pipe, and I'm sure that Africa will be contributing to the R&D uh, for this as well. Next slide. The next are the implantables. Very exciting. There are a number of other developments using TAC, Cabotecova, um, and I'm about to tell you about a very exciting new molecule in Statrophia. These are reversible and renewable, um, uh, long-acting, uh, of course. Next slide. And this molecule, I believe, could be a game changer. It's incredibly potent. It has a new mode of action. Um, previously known as MK8591, this latrivia is the new kid on the block. Next slide. So you see that it can be put into an implant. The first dose finding studies have been done, and uh, this implant may be able to deliver uh, oral and um, implantable prep over an annual period, so 12-month period. Next slide. It is being developed in oral football first, and we're about to move into the early studies to look at a monthly pill. It's a tiny pill taken once a month uh, as pre exposure prophylaxis. Next slide. The topicals, very exciting micro needles, and um, so a way to deliver antiretrovirals via micro Next slide. Um, and insulin, insulin uh, has also been developed in this way. Can you move along the slide, please? Thank you. And so, uh, very exciting time, I think you would be. Um, we have uh, a lot that um, we can do as, as a group, um, and I think the, the next few um, years will really um, open up all kinds of opportunities for us. Thank you so much.